Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a really interesting morning. Um, yeah, I'm going to take a, a slight detour um, and talk about how these how these sorts of technologies that we've been hearing about, how the use of data uh, within cities might be productively used to make good decisions. Um, my background is as a civil engineer, so I'm, um, um, I used to work at Arup, and we were really interested then as like, how do we make um, technology, how do we make built environment and infrastructure that really serves people? Um, outside of my, um, I'm now uh, an academic trying to kind of uh, continue that path, but outside um, of that role, I'm also a feminist activist within the UK, um, kind of fighting for um, uh, um, against sexual violence. I have to be careful that I'm anti-sexual violence. I think that's implicit, but anyway. Um, uh, so what I'm going to try and do today is, is, is talk about the ways in which we can um, uh, usefully intersect, intersect these two fields. Um, and a lot of the um, work that I will be presenting today came out of a 18-month a, a kind of collaboration with C40 Cities. And what they were interested in um, was um, supporting uh, their Women for Climate program with um, proper uh, f research. Um, and so we were, we were working with them first to understand how is climate change gendered? How, it, how does that play out in cities? And how are our responses to climate change also gendered? And what should we be doing about it? So, you know, I'll try and cover that uh, now. Um, was anyone at Habitat 3 in 2017, 2016? Okay, so this was um, an international conference which set the agenda for the future of cities. And this was an um, international declaration where cities all around the world committed to this goal uh, and this vision. So this is, we share a vision of cities for all, referring to the equal use and enjoyment of cities and human settlements, seeking to promote inclusivity and ensure that all inhabitants of present and future generations without discrimination of any kind are able to inhabit and produce just, safe, healthy, accessible, affordable, resilient and sustainable cities and human settlements to foster prosperity and quality of life for all. Um, doable, <laughs> actionable. Um, my uh, interest when both participating in these international conferences and looking on the ground um, uh, is the disconnect between the actions that we take at a technical level in cities. Even urban policymakers are not at that, that table. I'm not surprised that no one here was also at that table. But how do we take these international de declarations and make them real? How do we make them design um, uh, criteria? Um, and in order to get there, I'm going to try and make an argument. Um, and this is, this is the argument I'm going to make uh, today. Firstly, I want to convince you that gender is an important category of identity um, in the way that we experience the city. Gender affects the way in which we can use urban infrastructure. Secondly, I want to say that what, what we do not measure is not known um, and we cannot action it. Um, and uh, fourthly, that tech innovation itself is gendered. And taking all of those into account, what do we do about it? How do we make, how do we take seriously and make explicit those, um, those, um, not that knowledge? So firstly, gender is an important category of identity. Um, uh, th so this is a, oh, it's not very good resolution, but you can see that there are all sorts of decisions that we make every day um, that influence our ability to use certain types of infrastructure. So um, here we can see from this um, um, slide that um, our perception of safety means that we are more or less likely to use certain roads at certain times of day. Uh, we know that our economic resources also give us ac differential access to certain um, uh, requirements. We know that um, due to the gendered division of labor, which is global, uh, women are much more likely than our men to have multi-stop journeys um, that are generally more encumbered. So they're carrying stuff, pushing stuff. Um, they might have caring responsibilities. Um, uh, which means that they have to do trip chaining, which often means that they're paying many times more 
uh, for each ride. Um, and that actually they tend to travel at off-peak hours where we um, have less efficient or less um, um, uh, regular uh, infrastructure provision. So we can see how, that, how our um, gendered um, uh, categories of identity affect how efficiently or well the system is designed for us. Um, and one um, way, like really obvious and overly simplified, um, um, way of understanding this is if this is a London tube map and but it looks pretty much like any other kind of metro map that you might see anywhere in the world and what we can see from this is that heavy infrastructure the big infrastructure systems privilege and prioritize access uh, getting as many people into the city in the morning as possible and out of the city in the evening um, uh, as possible um, the implicit assumption underneath this is that we should prioritize access to the paid daytime labor market. Um, and this um, um, ignores uh, the, uh, so uh, within our engineering design decisions, that's, there are these implicit uh, assumptions that reinforce. Um, I haven't mentioned sexual violence, um, but it's something, of course, another, another way in which we kind of block access to, to public infrastructure decisions. I hope that's a convincing argument that, that the city is gendered and our infrastructure is gendered. Uh, so next, what is not measured is not known. In policy making, in having influence in good in decisions, um, we need to be able to make convincing case uh, and often numbers really help with that. Uh, so uh, we did a study um, with San Francisco looking at um, the data around women and biking and the use of cycling infrastructure. This is a very, uh, so uh, we found that 29% of people uh, cycling in that area were women. That is quite standard. Uh, if you look at most cities across the world, it's about uh, 30%. 30, th um, 30%. It doesn't have to be like that in um, a lot of Scandinavian countries. Actually, the uh, infrastructure enables families using psych uh, cycle lanes much more often. Um, but within that, we also have to, of course, understand that um, uh, there is a race and um, um, economic dimension of this. In fact, um, all, um, women of colour are underrepresented in cycling as well. Um, again, as I said before, this, the, the evidence show that, um, that women are, less like, are more likely to use cycle infrastructure for non-work-related purposes, which means that the the um, go as fast as you can, the most direct route doesn't work for lots of people. So optimizing um, around certain parameters um, uh, um, is implicitly gendered. And so from this study, we made very kind of um, uh, small observations um, uh, that are kind of quite generic uh, <laughs> globally, um, but just it provides evidence uh, for more protect, uh, protected bike lanes and something that will come up again and again, um, that uh, partnerships are going to be key in understanding and tackling um, gender-related issues. So using this kind of evidence, uh, using gender disaggregated data actually helps create the evidence for um, uh, uh, gender policy. Uh, one of the key tools that we're really pushing is around gender budgeting. So this is um, really trying to say that it is, um, uh, if our aspiration is to give equal access to resources, then we have to understand um, the differential needs of people. So if you have a disabled person traveling around the city, it is justified from a gender budgeting point of view to spend more money in providing that service. So when we can start to create more gender disaggregated data, then we'll be able to provide more um, evidence and justification um, for, the, for um, providing economic resource to meet those needs. Um, I, we're quite heavily, we have been quite heavily critical of um, creating action on climate change with, uh, with solely a technocratic framing. This Technocratic framing sets up kind of social issues or the city as simply a technical uh, problem that can be solved. The problem with this is that it doesn't incorporate or um, 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 
allow decisions on things that can't be measured. So we've been talking about things that can be measured, but some things around kind of sexual violence, um, which are, which are and always will be heavily underreported. How do you therefore justify if, if you're only using technocratic framing as your key value, um, uh, um, important decisions around that. So um, we need much more actions around participatory um, decision making. I think one really interesting example that I read yesterday around this sort of issue is that LA did a study on, gen um, on gender and their um, trans public transport system and made open the information that 14 women had been raped in one year on the public transport system in LA. When they made that public, um, there was huge outcry. It wasn't seen as a progressive thing for the government to do. It, they were heavily critiqued um, and it kind of that message backfired on the, on the government rather than taking an issue seriously and um, getting the information. It, it was seen as um, proof that LA is completely unsafe. Anyway, I'm running out of time. Um, so the third and final point that I wanted to make was that who are the innovators matters. If it is um, uh, uh, people who are, are interested in solving a climate issue, but this is seen as a sensible solution whereby people can't walk down the road or there is a privileging of road use space, and then we have an issue. Does urban innovation around data technology look like this? Um, I argue that if there were more um, inclusive or diverse um, groups of people being invested in to um, uh, create uh, data-based solutions, uh, then we might get somewhere. There is some data here that will be, I'm sure, made available. Uh, you can look on the web, uh, Women for Climate website as well about the difference in venture capital funding for start tech startups. Um, it's uh, this is for clean tech, but it's kind of pervasive and the cultural norm within um, within the field. Um, so just to end, um, bringing all of this knowledge together um, into action requires both uh, gender expertise. We need to understand the gendered issue uh, and be able to incorporate that into our technical solutions. But we also need women at the table and we need to um, uh, take, uh, ensure that there is a diversity um, of decision-making. Um, and then both of these things need to be brought together to form um, accountable strategies that can be measured both with data, um, but also qualitative um, uh, uh, data as well uh, that, should, that should be taken seriously. Um, so some of these explicit strategies, there is no, never going to be um, like a silver bullet on social uh, complex social issues, but um, data partnerships, women's safety audits, mentorship uh, for women in tech, um, angel investment, gender disaggregated data is a huge one. And I'm glad uh, that your slide had that data. Um, um, open data reporting. I just, there's all of the things. <laughs> Participation. More? Gender expertise. And uh, of course, I'm a researcher, so we need more research as well. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll take questions after. <laughs>